Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Messer and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. Now let's get to one company that I gotta say, Tim, was already on track to be in the news this week. We knew that. Yeah, but for, for good stuff. Yeah. Uh, we're talking stuff. about Macy's. It's usually a big week for Macy's ahead of their Thanksgiving Day Parade and Black Friday. It kicks off the all important holiday shopping season for it and the rest of the nation's retailers. Yet, it's kind of been a rough start to it all. Macy's said it would delay its third quarter earnings release after an investigation revealed an employee had more than a hundred million dollars of expenses. Macy's share is down about 2.6% as we speak with some insight into really what the heck is going on. We got Bloomberg Television's Romain Bostic here in our studio. He's the co-host of The Close coming up in a little less than an hour on Bloomberg TV. So you spoke with the folks over at Macy's today. What, what's going on here? I, I did, and unfortunately, I can't really tell you what's going on because there was only so much they would share. I mean, yeah. this is a pretty big deal. Now, obviously, in terms of the actual dollar amount, this is a drop in the bucket when you consider their overall revenue. But you're talking mm. about uh, an employee who was effectively in charge of certain things when it came to their delivery operations. 130 to roughly $154 million over a three year period, apparently unaccounted for. Now I asked Macy specifically, was this money stolen? Was this just yeah. expenses that were miscategorized? They could not say, they said that the investigation is still in the early stage uh, and they weren't able to actually uh, share publicly exactly what happened other than to say that the employee is no longer there. I mean, I don't want to read too much into mm -hmm. it, right? Because we've got to get more mm -hmm. details and we want to be careful here, but it does make you wonder about like oversight or something or what, what, what was going on? Well, that's the big question because they're basically pinning this on one single employee. Now, right. uh, you know, not to get, be too glib about it, but you know, you know, one employee making off with a few thousand dollars sounds plausible. One employee uh, potentially making off or at least obscuring uh, hundred, uh, over a hundred million dollars. Yeah. Uh, that's a lot for one person. I mean, I know there are a lot of overachievers out there, but I, I think I would need a little bit of help. Uh, but, they, but they said right now that they think that this has yeah. been nipped in the blood. They did make it clear that this actually came about while they were preparing their earnings report. Uh, and they just noticed some discrepancies and then they did a deeper dive and then they made the decision that it was better to hold off on issuing that report until they got a, a fuller investigation of what was happening. But this is also a time when Macy's is trying to do a huge turnaround right now. Yeah. You've got a relatively new CEO, someone you've spoken with mm -hmm. quite a bit over the last few months. Um, explain the backdrop that this is happening against. Well, the backdrop is basically a slowdown in sales growth for the company overall, Macy's Inc. That's the large umbrella company. Of course, their major properties are Macy's the store, Bloomingdale's the store, and Blue Mercury, which focuses on cosmetics. Blue Mercury is doing great. Yeah. Bloomingdale's, believe it or not, is doing great. Macy's stores themselves, not so great. On a comp sales basis, they were down 3%. That's just at the Macy's branded stores. But right. that, that drags down the Inc., the umbrella comp sales down as a whole, also lower. Of course, the company will f focus on Bloomingdale's. The current CEO of Macy's Inc., Tony Spring, used to run Bloomingdale's. So there's a big reason why he became CEO of the overall company, because he did a lot to turn that around. And Blue Mercury is doing better as well, as a lot of people are still willing to buy cosmetics and skincare. Guilty as charged. Yeah. But no, I, like listen, whether it's Sephora, right, or all of those, um, they've really done well. But I feel like Bloomingdale's is different from Macy's in terms yes. of their customer in a big way. And I do wonder whether, you know, Tony Spring, you know, can make those adjustments. Well, that's a big part of the oh. problem. And I've asked them this in past calls. Now, they wouldn't want, they didn't want to talk about this today. They, they're saying that when they release their earnings, which they say will be done. December 11th, by, right? Well, they yeah. said by December 11th, okay. so it could come before that, but they expect to have the earnings release and the conference call by December 11th. But to your point, Bloomingdale's had much more of a, uh, I guess, niche customer, if you will. It was mm -hmm. much more definable than Macy's. Macy's was kind of everything to all people. Right. And as you know, that's the big challenge for department stores right now, is how do you be everything to all people in a world where I think a lot of shoppers want something that's a little bit more personalized, a little bit more niche. And I think yeah. Tony Spring did a good job with that with Bloomingdale's, but he was dealing with the customer base that was kind of right for them. How much digital are they doing over on the Macy's side? Is I, that productive for them? I think or? the last quarter they said roughly it's still, it's sort of tracking around the 30% range. So okay. that varies pretty wildly depending on which brand you're talking about. Yeah. Again, it's doing relatively well for Bloomingdale's, relatively well for 
Blue Mercury, Macy's is still kind of that nut that they have to crack. And they have tried something. And I want to point out, they had this thing they call, these are smaller stores called the First 50 that Tony Springs mm-hmm. set up, said, let's do smaller concepts. We don't necessarily need these gigantic, you know, tens of thousands of square feet, hundreds of thousands of square feet at some of these stores. We need smaller versions of these. That will do better. They, they identified 50 stores uh, that they did that. And if you break out just those 50 stores away from the other Macy's, they're actually doing pretty well. Three consecutive quarters of comp sales growth in the most recent quarter, it was up 2%. So down on Macy's as a whole, but those first 50 Macy's stores and when they've redesigned yeah. the smaller format, up almost 2%. Okay, so in this case, smaller could be better. We'll have to wait and see maybe a few more quarters to make that determination. That's Here's... a nice sport coat you're wearing, oh, by the way. You. Where'd you get that from? Thank you. Um, I don't uh, actually know. Okay. This might be a J. Crew, not a Macy's or a Bloomingdale's. Um, but I asked the question. Gotta love okay. guys. Oh, I, I, I love I'm when guys gonna, uh, talk clothes. Shares down as much as five percent earlier in the yeah. trade. Down a little more than two percent right now. What do you think it is that analysts are reacting to here? I, I think it's just the. It's a one-off how, charge here. Well, but and there's also million dollars, hundred million. But there's but. also the issue of how deep does it go, right? Mm-hmm. And what I, else did they miss? Right. Anytime you see something like this, the big, yeah. big question is: if there's smoke, is there a fire? Now, again, the the company line right now, both both in what they told me on the call as well as in the press release, is that. This is an isolated incident and that it has been contained, but they could not give me any details right now uh, reassuring me of that. And they said they will have more details. Another I mean, criminal? We don't know. Like, we don't know. So, all right. Yeah. For someone like you who knows this company well, just got about 30 seconds left here. I mean, the worst case scenario would be what? The best case scenario is what? Well, the best case scenario, it is, it is just $100 million, as they said, $154 million. As they say, when you look at their total expenses that they were logging, that was $4.6 billion, so a small fraction okay. of what their expenses were. That's the upside. Now, the potential downside, if there's more to this or this was more widespread, then that potentially becomes an issue. All right, so next focal point is when we finally get their earnings, right? Yeah, hopefully before December Or Black 11th, Friday, when you're December shopping, 11th. right? When yeah. you're shopping, because mm-hmm. you want that coat that Tim's got, right? That's a nice coat. I know, I yeah, know. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff, as always. Romain Bostek, co-host of The Close on Bloomberg TV. It's coming your way at the top of the hour, so be sure to check it out. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. I'm just looking at treasuries right now. Two-year note, uh, we've seen yields definitely back off. Uh, now 427 on that two-year note, and I'm looking at a 10-year at 426. So talk about um, a flattening, certainly, of the curve that we've seen. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the treasury trade. We mentioned this earlier. Uh, we have seen treasuries added to some of the gains from that late Friday announcement of Scott Besant, a Wall Street veteran who investors expect will take the sting out of the administration's more aggressive trade and economic policy proposals. Uh, Of course, he was nominated to be President-elect Donald Trump's Treasury Secretary choice. With some thoughts on that and the market outlook post-election, we go now to Aaron Kennan. He's co-founder and CEO over at Clear Harbor Asset Management. They've got about uh, $1.5 billion in assets under management. Aaron joining us once again from Stanford, Connecticut. Aaron, good to have you back with us. We we haven't spoken to you since the election result earlier this month. I'm, I'm just wondering, big picture, how your views have, have shifted now that we know who is going to be the next president and, and the more we're learning about the president-elect's cabinet choices. Yeah, thanks for having me back, Tim and Carol. Um, it, it certainly has been interesting. We started to see these trends just before the election as the markets, uh, the, the betting markets that is priced in uh, or starting to price in a, a Trump victory. But certainly on the equity side, we, we've seen uh, much more of a convergence of performance. So not just the MAG-7, not just the, the tech sector, not just um, the, the communication sector, but rather financials and industrials and utilities and and um, in, in other areas of the market, such as energy and materials. And so I think that's one theme that, that may actually continue into 2025. And then you mentioned interest rates. I mean, clearly, uh, with the selection of Scott Besson, and we, we've seen rates um, decline uh, notably today, there's a sense that um, that perhaps the, the deficit spending concern that the market had, regardless of who won, frankly, um, could, could, could be quelled on, on the margin because uh, we, we have uh, someone who is quite experienced at the U.S. Treasury and perhaps will have a little more discipline on that front. And so I think... Yeah. Uh, there, there's, there's a sense there that uh, it'll allow the Fed to, to worry less about inflation, to think a little more about the employment and growth picture, and perhaps the lower 50% of the economic stratum, which has still been under 
a lot of pressure uh, over the last couple of years. Aaron, how do you game this out? I, I am just curious some of the conversations you might be having with some of your investors, your clients, the money that you guys have under management about all right, what really happens, right? There's the campaign, and I think it's fair to say that ahead of the outcome that folks came on and said, listen, either way it's going to be good for the markets because you have candidates that promise everything, right, um, to kind of get people to vote on it. But I do wonder what the reality is of now that we know it will be a second term for Donald Trump and his team, what will be the reality of of policies that ultimately take place? Will it be the extremes that everybody is talking about, or will it be more likely no or something in the middle? I don't want to sound too cute, Carol, but you know I think there this is the difference between trading and investing to a great extent. Um, there are certain trends that clearly coming out of the Trump administration, we think on day one will impact asset prices across fixed income, equities, even private equity. So one trend, for example, as we game this out and think about medium and long-term trends for, for our clients um, is um, how lower regulatory environment, lesser regulatory impact could, could potentially provide a tailwind to mergers and acquisitions. Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean for small cap and mid cap companies? But what does it also uh, mean for certain sectors within the economy that over the last four or five years have underperformed the sort of tech trends or financials or even mid cap, smaller cap um, financial companies that are sort of consulting uh, within M&A? Uh, and, and also, you know, what does it mean for the democratization that we've seen of private equity and the growth in, in that landscape and, and the publicly traded asset managers that are, are really seeing revenues accelerate on the heels of them continuing to uh, attract capital, frankly, from, from clients at firms like Clear Harbor Asset Management, uh, who, who we believe uh, in, in some cases may be deserving uh, their portfolios and their risk tolerance may may require them to have some of that exposure. So we're thinking very much long term and even artificial intelligence, very hot topic. But how is it really impacting other segments of the economy outside of technology? And so we think about how is it impacting biotechnology and healthcare, and maybe the acceleration of uh, some of the phase one, two and three work that's being done and, you know, sort of molecule research and development. And how is it even impacting utilities, artificial intelligence, and the smart grid? So we're we're trying to think longer term about these trends, and we're we're trying to make, not make any you know one huge bet as it pertains to this. Hey, Aaron, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, about Doge. Uh, no, not Dogecoin. The Department <laughs> of Government Efficiency. Elon Musk, Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, they uh, vowed to cut two trillion dollars in spending. Uh, from the federal budget, we're talking, you know, 20% goes to Social Security, 18% to national defense, 15% to health, about 14% just goes to interest. Uh, do you think they can pull it off? And if they do, how, how do you look at it from an investment perspective? Well, it, it, in some ways, in the long term, I hope they can pull it off because I think we need to get our sort of fiscal house in order and start balancing our revenue collection with our expenses, and and that may require some significant pain in certain aspects of, of of society, and that's unfortunate. But we do need to bring ourselves back to that north star. But you bring up a good point, Tim, and that is, to the extent that Doge is successful, and Elon Musk mentioned, well, maybe he could cut two trillion dollars out of an annual budget. I don't know if he was thinking over a five-year period or a ten-year period, but he seemed to in intimate it was one. It was over an annualized period. If that's the case, which would still not bring our, our ourselves in, in, into balance, um, I, I think we would have to ask ourselves, the GDP trends that we've seen over the last several years have heavily um, been impacted by the, the deficit spending, the unsustainable deficit spending. We've all applied to the GDP. We've always sort of had consternation around the, the, the deficit spending. But this could be a reverse where we have less deficit spending and we have lower GDP. Now, the, the positive silver lining in all this, which we have to analyze is productivity and whether or not we can achieve productivity gains to offset that. But, but that's something I think investors are not yet totally sort of grappling with. And to be fair to them, uh, it's not clear exactly how this Doge process will work. Ultimately, Congress has to um, decide on, on some of these spending initiatives. Are you anticipating um, a next four years or at least a couple of years where markets trade on posts that come off of Truth Social? I, I don't think of it that way. I mean, I, I think there are some um, very qualified people that um, that 
uh, incoming President Trump has selected. There are certainly some people. But there were a lot of qualified within. people the first time around, and then yet there were still a lot of social media posts. That's right, and there was a lot of there was a lot of turnover as well, and I think that's uh, that's something that I'm keeping my eye on. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we have some interesting picks. Um, some are, I think, highly qualified. Will they stick around for for a year or two or three or four? And and that'll that'll I think be important right. to investors to sort of ponder. Well, so glad we got some time with you. We've been wanting to get your view uh, now that the election is over. Aaron Kennan, co-founder, CEO at Clear Harbor Asset Management. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Listen live each weekday starting at 2 p.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. A Bloomberg scoop today. Also a most read story, our colleague Todd Gillespie reporting that Citi is using retention bonuses alongside management changes and tech upgrades to remake the bank's offering for ultra-rich customers. Interesting. Yeah. So doing more, doing less. Trying to keep trying to keep these employees on by enticing them. And also the new uh, or new-ish head of wealth management has been doing a lot of traveling to many parts of the world to meet with clients. I gotta say the wealth business, right? That's something that I feel like whoever we talked to came up uh, with the folks over at Schwab uh, on the West Coast. I mean, right? It's the wealth management business just continues to grow. Um, if you didn't notice, we are approaching bonus season. Meredith Dennis has a great view on how that could look for Wall Street. She is managing partner at the financial search firm Prospect Rock Partners. The company does placement in finance, also operations for private equity firms, investment banks, and the like. She joins us right here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Welcome, welcome. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Well, tell us about your world and what you are seeing in terms of placement. Demand, who's hiring, what kind of hiring, what's going mm -hmm. on? So there's a lot going on, and a lot has happened since um, the presidential election. I think we're seeing definitely an uptick in hiring uh, over the past two weeks. We're seeing uh, firms really um, start to close on their pipeline, and as they get the deals across the finish line, there's more certainty in terms of fee income. More certainty in terms of fee income means more... Um, money for the bonus pool, and also more money for deepening that bench. So Meredith, was this just a case of deals waiting for the election outcome? Or like, help me understand, because deals actually are in the pipeline, they're working and they're working. And so I, I don't know if there's really a cause and effect here, or tell me. Well, I think, um, I think there was a couple of things that happened. Number one, I think um, interest, the interest rate market started to stabilize. Um, I think, uh, given the rate cuts, along with the certainty from the presidential election, um, deals really started to move across the finish line. I think um, prior and second, you know, even second quarter, um, you know, there was a lot of discussion of pipeline, but a lot of those deals just didn't close. A lot of hung deals, and that caused a lot of uncertainty in terms of hiring and also what could potentially impact bonuses. Now we're seeing deals come across the finish line. Yeah. Fee income is coming in, so bonuses are, are much more certain than they had been. Bonuses for who, though? Bonuses, uh, I would say, for debt capital markets. Um, I would say that would be up you know, 20%, 20 to 25%, you're seeing the equity capital markets open up again. Um, M&A, you're seeing deals come across the finish line there. And you're, so I would expect, you know, a five to 10% bump in bonus for them. We're not talking 2021 levels, um, but definitely a much rosier picture than it has been over the past 18 to 24 months. You know, your team shared with us some notes. So the most significant compensation rebound since the record-breaking 2021, is that fair? Yes, that is. Interesting. Okay, so um, do you expect it to continue? Does 2025 even look more promising? Um, well, I think 2025, if you consider the fact that the pipelines are really robust, um, and there's a gen, you know, a genuine feeling of momentum, and the interest rate environment is stabilized, and the, you know, we now are moved past some of the, the presidential uncertainty. So yes, I do think 2025 is going to be a lot rosier, um, given the certainty of of the markets. Carol and I talk a lot about uh, the first Milken Institute Global Conference that we went to post pandemic was help me out, Carol, October of 2021. I, I think believe. so, yeah. 
And then we went to another one a few months later because that's when they the spring you know, one, the spring which is, is normally. when they're normally doing it. Um, private credit has been just the talk of that conference the entire time. I see you nodding your head, Meredith. What are you seeing in your world when it comes to private credit Explosive. right now? Explosive. Still. Explosive. Still. Absolutely. Um, I think private credit is much more nimble, obviously, than than the, the public debt markets. And I think, um, you know, it's it's become kind of the sweetheart of private equity in a lot of ways. Um, and so I think you're going to see continued explosive growth in private credit. Even if rates go down? I think it will take a while for rates to go down, and the flexibility of private credit is 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 extremely attractive, um, and the innovation behind it. It's really a creative a, a creative debt product. So when it comes to jobs and people looking for jobs, is a lot of it private credit? Like what what is going on that you're seeing? Right, you're you're involved in placement. Right. I'm just curious. So uh, there's uh, private credit is is really hot right now, um, but investment banking is is starting to really pick up. Before in the last eighteen months, I was seeing a lot on uh, biotech, biopharma, mm. life life sciences, M and A. I'm seeing a lot. Obviously, I was seeing a lot in terms of software, fintech, investment banking. Now we're mm. seeing it expand to fig. Um, you're seeing some consumer, some industrials. Um, so it's really kind of an exciting time. It used to just, uh, yeah. Well, do you do, pl- do you do placement for roles that are in technology too? Uh, on the corporate side, yeah. corporate development. So not not on the more on the strategic um, M and A side okay. than on um, technology. The reason I ask is Carol did this panel last week at the Schwab Impact Conference mm-hmm. about AI, um, all about AI. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And one question that you said kept coming up was, you know, when are these banks going to? Well, some of them are doing it. Schwab is doing it. J P Morgan is doing it. Uh, but do their own versions of these chatbots, these LLMs. And I'm wondering the hiring that's happening around there. That's interesting. Um, you know, I imagine as they come out, the, the hiring needs will will increase. I haven't seen it, um, but that doesn't mean it's it's not there and happening. It just means maybe I'm not I'm not privy to to, to that side of the market right now. Hey, I am curious too, within your world, like how closely people are watching um, President-elect Donald Trump, as we are like obsessed with the nominees and as he's really kind of very quickly laid out what his administration could potentially look like um, if, if everybody gets confirmed and if it all settles in. But how closely in terms of some of the things you're laying out is contingent on kind of who is in those top spots, whether it's SEC, whether it's, you know, the various financial regulatory bottles. We've been, uh, uh, bodies, I should say, we've been talking a lot about Scott Besant, right, for mm-hmm. Treasury Secretary, and the markets seem to like that. Mm-hmm. Help me out here in terms of what you are hearing on that front. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of it has to do with the regulatory environment and how stringent the regulatory environment is going to be going forward. Um, and so anybody, um, the market likes anybody who is a little bit less stringent. Um, and so um, I believe that this, you know, I, I think what we're seeing in terms of nominees are people that are going to be relatively hands off. Yeah. Um, and the market likes that. Yeah. And so that I'm not saying that, you know, it's a wave on through um, for every merger deal, but definitely maybe a little bit easier than it has been in the past or even just with the certainty of, of who it's going to be um, is giving some solace to what's going on in terms of M&A. Right. So are you are you hearing a sigh of relief from your clients right now or the sense that, hey, we're going to be able to do a lot more over the next four years than we were able to do. So I am hearing a lot of, you know, we right size, you know, the market, the, the recruiting market was kind of a, a little sluggish, obviously, as, as banks right size their, their employee base. Um, and now I'm hearing, hey, maybe we should deepen that bench. Mm. We, it's time to kind of build the reserves back a little bit um, because it will be busy. So I don't know if it's a sigh of relief or just a genuine feeling of optimism that um, things are going to be busy. Hmm. 
So, I, yeah, in terms of mood and sentiment, I mean, I love. I feel like you have a really good vantage point, right? In terms of the people that you talk with, probably small firms, big firms, lots of different firms across the different types of, you know, financial firms, as we said, investment banking, or whether you're dealing with PE or private credit. So, is there been like a noticeable shift in kind of mood post election, and is it is it just? Whew, the election's over is it just or is it something more than that i think it's more than that i what i'm seeing is that the bulge racket is coming back into the market as the bulge racket comes back in and the elite boutiques start to pick up a little bit more aggressively than just opportunistic hires yeah uh the middle market starts to shake in their boots a little because that's where those opportunistic hires and aggressive hires come from those middle market employees who have really solid close deal experience maybe a to a promotes um, and so all of it is just pushing upward a little bit. So yeah. this is one of the first times that we're seeing people really up tier in brand. Um, I hadn't, I haven't so really people seen moving that. from like a middle market firm up to, to a, yes, yeah. or like a tier, you know, a tier two to a tier one. Mm -hmm. Um, that's happening a little bit more, um, all the riffs. Um, that happened. They've they've kind of been cycled through. A lot of those people who were really quality qualified people have found jobs, which is wonderful news. Um, so if you think you're going to be picking up, you know, somebody from a bulge racket elite boutique who's been riffed due to kind of a sluggish environment, that's not going to happen anymore. Geographically, where are the hires happening? New York, San Francisco, um, Chicago. I would say Chicago is really interesting because of industrials. Uh, you'll see in the interest rate environment going down means that industrial business will go up. Um, Charlotte um, and probably energy, a little bit of Houston. You, renewables. you didn't say Miami. Love Miami. Love uh, Palm Beach. A lot of health care down there. A lot of health care hiring down there. Okay, no offense, but RIF versus layoff. I don't know that I'd, re what, reduction in, what is it? Reduction in force? Is that what it means? Reduction Just in quickly. force. Uh, so, you know, I think reduction in force is, is typically kind of a larger group of people and it could have been a firm-wide performance or it could have been a market impact or something okay. like that. Whereas, you know. I've never, like, have you? No. No. Very cool stuff, very cool stuff. Um, great perspective, thank you. Thanks for coming in, Meredith Dennis. Uh, she is managing partner at Prospect Rock Partners right here on Bloomberg. I'm driving in my car, I turn on the radio. Yeah, how about you let me drive? Oh no, 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 no. Who's gonna drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive on. Excuse me, I wanna drive. It drives and you it. It's the question that drives us. This is the drive to the close. That funk to music will drive us till the dawn. On Bloomberg Radio. All right, everybody. Just about 18 minutes left in today's trading session, getting ready to wrap up the Monday trade. A shortened holiday uh, schedule this week because of Thanksgiving, of course. And it does feel like it's a little bit mellow. It's going to be quiet. Yes. On Wednesday, I imagine. Uh, I would say so. Yeah. Friday at the week. New York Stock Exchange is a fun day because uh, everyone brings their kids in. Oh, do they? Yeah, Santa shows up. It's like a it's like a holiday tradition. It's pretty cool because the kids are off of school, but the traders have to do a half day. And there's plenty of room on the floor because there's, there's no like, traders on the floor anymore. <laughs> I'm that is just so true. Say. That is so true. Let's see what our next guest uh, has to say about the market environment. Jim Schmigel is chief investment officer at SEI. They've got about 1.6 trillion in assets under management, based in suburban Philly. Uh, joining us right here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York City. Hello, hello, welcome, welcome. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Great to have you here. One point six trillion. That's a lot. A lot of institutional investors. A lot of institutional. A lot of retail. Uh, there's a lot of AUA in there as well mm -hmm. as AUM. So yeah, we are good point. a bit of a diversified financial services firm. We do three legs of our stool. We do back office uh, outsourcing, particularly in the alternative space. Yeah. Uh, we have a technology platform which does really, really well with uh, banks, large banks, money center banks, regional banks. And then we have our asset management uh, platform as well, which is uh, not surprisingly where uh, I find myself the housed uh, nowadays. So um, in an OCIO context, we're um, dealing with institutional investors, DB, DC, ENF, uh, but on the retail side as well. So delivering uh, model portfolios. Uh, to registered investment advisors, to regional banks, things along those lines. All right, so what's changed since the election for you? 
Well, uh, you know, what's what's changed, uh, I guess, you know, first and foremost, we're, we're risk on. We're feeling really good about that. Our investors are feeling really good about that. Uh, so what they, does that mean? Did you guys start moving stuff more aggressively into certain areas as a result or not yet? Not Well, I wouldn't say we've been moving anything post-election. You know, as uh, as a fiduciary uh, providing advice, you have to look past the election. Of course, that's what we did. Um, and, you know, we looked at the commonalities between all the potential outcomes. It was it was pretty obvious early on that the tails were kind of being taken up out of the distribution, particularly from a, like a Democratic sweep perspective. So that was one that was pretty unlikely, just given the numbers, particularly uh, in, in the Senate, were really kind of stacked against the Democrats. So, so we knew that there were some outcomes that were very, very unlikely, uh, focusing on those that were more likely, uh, that there was going to be divided government. Typically, markets love divided government, keeps government kind of all, you know, kind of busy with itself and kind of not focused on this everything else. This isn't really divided government. Well, though. that's that's the outcome that, you know, obviously came to bear is not that at, at all, but the market is pretty is pretty happy about it. So, does, and, does, and it, does, of, it, does it make you nervous that policies will happen maybe too quickly without the checks and balances that we've had in the past? I, I don't think so, because it's not, you know, within within the House, within the Senate, you're looking at fairly uh, slim majorities. And, you know, the cabinet that is being put together, uh, particularly Friday's news with uh, uh, Bassan, I mean, pretty, pretty favorable uh, result from that kind of, um, you know, debate over who's going to be the next Treasury Secretary. What does that Congress. signal to you about whether Trump uh, makes good on the tariff promises uh, that he made during the campaign and also on yeah. other economic promises, including reducing the workforce here in the U.S. by deporting a lot of people. Yeah, I think it adds, uh, and you're seeing you're seeing it today. I mean, with a 10-year trading below 4.3%, uh, 4.27 uh, 4, 4, before I walked in here. That's a big, big move. So, you know, what the market is assuming is that, you know, some of the Things that, that Scott has articulated before about the Trump policy, really putting it into the context of, look, this is an opening salvo. You're talking about a big real estate investor here who's used to negotiating. The market likes that message. So in this in this idea that we're taking kind of some of the tails out of the dis distribution, what the market feels like to me today, the tail that's being, that's being taken out is 60% on China and 10% on everything else. That's kind of off the table, and it's going to be a little bit more strategic. Probably not going to be as big as uh, what most people think. Probably will be phased in. And therefore, that kind of knee-jerk kind of view that this is going to be this huge inflationary impulse that we're going to see in 2025, I think a lot of investors are reassessing that. How much do you think about history? We were talking with our Alexandra Semenova earlier because uh, the Wall Street strategists are putting out you know, their targets for the S&P 500. Um, FYI. Didn't do so well last year. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody got it wrong. No, Every, rece no recession last year. That was the big call. Big Every, flop. Come right. on, guys. <laughs> so um, we're in the third year of a bull market, yeah. right? Uh, it's pretty phenomenal, the returns that we've seen. Very bullish gains this year, last year. Um, the third year historically, at least over the past 50 years, has historically been the weakest uh, with single digit average gains and a much larger percentage of stocks suffering declines. This is some data from BMO. Um, I don't know, what what do you think will really be the, the catalyst for the market? Will it be historically, we've had two big years, so mm. maybe it's time for a down year. Yeah. Um, will it be a new president who, yes, he's been in the White House before, but who knows what we might get this time around? Will it be ultimately the US economy yeah. and earnings? Like, yeah. what is it? I think it's rates. Uh, I think that's what everyone should be kind of focused on. Uh, we have a robust economy. We're going to get a, a first view of GDP later on this week. We'll get PCE. But look, the reality is we're, we're close to 3% on GDP. We're still above 3% on inflation. And, and the Fed's in, in easing mode. So we don't need those cuts. Um, I don't think we need these cuts. Now, a lot of cuts have already been priced out, right? So the, the Fed put themselves in a little bit of a bind. You, when they came out of the gate with 50, totally unnecessary. I think they're locked in for December. I think it would be uh, odd from an optical perspective to come out with a 50 basis point cut, do a 25 after the election, and then pause. <clears throat> So we'll probably get another 25 basis point reduction in December and then start talking about skipping meetings and pausing in early December. But the reality is we're lowering rates. We're stimulating an already fairly robust economy. Uh, we're going to get le less regulation for sure. Uh, we're going to get tariffs in some way, shape, or form, hopefully not as big as what everyone expected. That's the thought. That's what we're trading off today. But that, that doesn't tell me four and a quarter on the 10-year. That tells me four and three quarters on the 10-year. And that's what we're looking at. We know what the Federal Reserve tells us, and we know what Jerome Powell tells us during press conferences. But, but do you buy that they aren't 
making decisions based on potential policies? Uh, it, you know, they're, they're human. Uh, it's a very, very tough job. I hate to be the critic out there kind of throwing stones. Um, it's very, very hard to kind of look through. I mean, think back to where we were prior to that September meeting, people calling for emergency rate cuts. I mean, cr crazy. The data can turn so, so quickly, uh, which in, in our mind, or in my mind, I should say, uh, I mean, that, that, that almost begs to go slow. Mm. That's what they should be doing. The, the 50 was something that just did catch me a, a bit off guard. It was the it was the last one before an election. <laughs> you do, you, you don't want, yeah, you don't want to yeah. appear political in any way, shape, or form. Do they have it in the back of their minds now? Uh, what might be on the horizon given given the red sweep? How could they? How can they not? I mean, they're they're unfortunately like all of us in this business. I mean, they're designed to predict the future. Well, look, That's a they, horrible. And Carol, they also look in. at the bond market, and the Absolutely. bond market is making its own reactions. So Absolutely, it yeah. is. And it, well, it's very well behaved uh, today. Today, today. So uh, to, and, you know, and this is look. This is going to be the volume is going to be down this week. We're going to see some kind of big moves. So you're going to have to look past this week, obviously. Wait but, till we all start talking about that fiscal debt. With that. Well, you know, that's a great thing to talk about because, you know, what one of the things that I would always say Quickly. to investors uh, is that it doesn't matter who wins, uh, deficits are going higher. <laughs> hey, I don't know. We're actually, we're talking about it. It's yeah. in the conversation now. Jim, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate it. You're listening to Bloomberg. This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.